President Xi Jinping describes China's relationship with Russia as vigorous, healthy and stable, with potential for even deeper cooperation. Hello, I'm Mike Walter, filling in for Anand Aidu, and this is The Heat. The Chinese head of state is in Moscow for a three-day state visit that included in-depth talks with his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, on Tuesday. They signed agreements to expand their strategic partnership and economic cooperation. CGTN's Huang Yue has this report from Moscow. Today has been a very busy day as Chinese President Xi Jinping had a packed schedule here in Moscow. Uh, earlier this afternoon, local time, the two presidents held formal meetings, both in a restricted format and expanded format. Uh, they have jointly met the press, and two joint statements have been signed and issued, one on deepening the two countries' comprehensive strategic partnership of coordination, and the other on promoting economic cooperation until 2030, marking plans and arrangements for the growth of the bilateral relations and wide-ranging cooperation between the two countries going forward. It's also worth mentioning that a joint declaration on the Ukraine issue was also released, in which uh, the Russian side reaffirms its commitment to the resumption of peace talks as soon as possible. And the two sides stress that responsible dialogue is the best way for appropriate solutions, calling for stopping all moves that lead to tensions and the protraction of fighting to prevent the crisis from getting worse or even out of control. And during today's meeting, uh, Xi Jinping said that there is a profound historical logic for China-Russia relationship to reach where it is today. He said China always opposed an independent foreign policy. And to consolidate and develop a, a well-China-Russia relations is a strategic choice China has made on the basis of its own fundamental interests and you know, the prevailing trends of the world. The relations between China and Russia are developing steadily in a healthy way, thanks to common efforts. The political trust between our countries strengthens, the common interests multiply, and the nations are getting closer. The cooperation in trade, investment, energy, culture, humanitarian, and inter-regional areas is developing. Russian business is ready to satisfy the growing Chinese energy demands, both within the current projects and those that are still being agreed upon. Earlier this morning, local time, President Xi started today's schedule with a meeting with uh, a Russian Prime Minister Mikhail Mishustin in the Russian Federation government house. And during their meeting, uh, President Xi invited the Russian Prime Minister and Russian President Putin to visit China to attend the third Belt and Road Initiative Forum, which will be held later this year because this year marks the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative. Also, during this meeting, uh, Xi Jinping said that China's new government, which was just elected earlier in March, pays high attention to the development of uh, China-Russia relations and called for enhancing exchanges by the mechanism of uh, regular meetings between the Chinese premier and the Russian prime minister. In response, Mishustin said the growth of uh, Russia-China relations is now at the highest level in history, and he expressed the hope that the two sides will further enhance people to people exchanges in such areas as culture, youth and sports. Huang Yue, CGTN, Moscow, Russia. To discuss this and much more, let's bring in our guest joining us from Moscow, Dmitry Babich. He is a journalist and a Russian political analyst. We also have Joseph Gregory Mahoney, who's a professor of politics and international relations at East China Normal University. That's in Shanghai. Out of Washington, D.C., Anton Fedyashin is a professor at, of history at American University. In Beijing, we find our good friend Victor Gao. He's chair professor at Suchow University. I want to welcome all of you to the show. Victor, why don't I start with you? Uh, this is uh, President Xi's first state visit since he he was re-elected. Uh, talk to us about the significance of that. Thank you very much for having me. I think President Xi Jinping's state visit to uh, Russia is one of the most important bilateral events between China and Russia. And the discussions, the press conference, and the joint statement, etc., have really covered all aspects in the bilateral relations and the commitment of two countries <clears throat> to promote the development of uh, China-Russian relations and cooperation in all respects, 
to the highest level in an unprecedented way. This demonstrates that the two countries really value their bilateral cooperation and friendship, and they refuse to have their cooperation being sabotaged by any event anywhere in the world. Now, secondly, I think equally importantly, if not more importantly, China has been talking with Russia about its peace proposal for ending the Ukrainian crisis. This is very important in the joint statement. The Russian side also has indicated their willingness to enter into peace talks with Ukraine in due course, and Russia has also reiterated its commitment to uh, respect the United Nations Charter. Now, I think these are very important uh, developments because the Chinese proposal for ending the war in Ukraine is the only peace proposal right now in front of mankind. And I think for the Chinese president to talk personally with the Russian president and urge on him the need and the importance of entering into negotiations and eventually ceasefire, uh, to achieve ceasefire and restoring of peace eventually between Russia and Ukraine will be very important because this will help to prevent the escalation of the war in Ukraine and avoid the war getting out of control from conventional war into non-conventional war. So I think the world's attention is on the summit meeting as it is happening in Moscow right now. We want to promote peace and we oppose war. Uh, you know, it's interesting getting Victor's perspective from uh, Beijing. Dimitri, let's get the, the viewpoint from Moscow about the importance of this get-together between these two uh, powerful leaders on the world stage. Uh, well, I uh, mostly agree with everything uh, Professor Gao had to say. I would only say uh, that uh, there were several uh, new elements to this meeting which were stressed by European press, not by me. For example, in France, Le Figaro Daily, uh, you know, in an article there, Isabelle Lasser, who usually doesn't like anything Russian, she suddenly had to acknowledge that uh, this was a success of Russian diplomacy and of Chinese diplomacy, and that now it has to be acknowledged by the West uh, that China is not uh, passively neutral in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. China stresses the fact that the main blame for everything that happened lies with NATO and with its uh, uncontrolled expansion after the end of the Cold War. Uh, also, I would point out uh, 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 an article in the Financial Times uh, where the author noted uh, that uh, the agreement to build uh, the power of Siberia 2, the second huge pipeline uh, to China, which will uh, pump uh, the natural gas originally, originally scheduled to be pumped to Europe, uh, that is a huge project. Uh, during the meeting, President Putin said that before the end of 2023, we are going to deliver to China 38, sorry, 98 billion cubic meters of gas. That is only possible if uh, power of Siberia 2 starts operating. So uh, the Financial Times make the conclusion that some kind of agreement was reached uh, between China and Russia on that huge economic project. Yeah, uh, as for the, the criticism from the United States, uh, uh, let me note that uh, Russia fully embraced uh, the Chinese, the 12 Chinese proposals, because we also want peace. We also want security for the nuclear power stations. And yes, we, more than anyone, want uh, uh, the fighting to stop as soon as possible. It is the United States and the European Union who want the victory. They say victory for Ukraine, but in fact, the victory for their agents in Ukraine. So, uh, basically, uh, this was a very, very special summit, uh, which I think is unprecedented, because China starts active diplomacy. China is getting out of the, uh, of the limitations uh, which were self-imposed, you know, after the Maoist period, you know, Deng Xiaoping imposed on China, very cautious, very peaceful, but still 
very cautious uh, foreign policy. Now China is embarking on something new and I think something very important for the world. Perhaps a bold new uh, approach. Let me let me ask you this, Victor. Um, uh, both presidents signed this joint statement on Tuesday, the first uh, to deepen the comprehensive strategic partnership and cooperation for the new era. The second, uh, a lengthier title, but just as important, one might add, a pre-2030 development plan on priorities in China-Russia economic cooperation. Unpack that for us. What are these two statements telling us? Well, I think uh, the joint statement is very profound and carries a lot of significance. Now, on the one hand, the two countries have committed to developing their cooperation in all respects, and both countries want to promote each other. For example, the 2030 initiative or China's modernization with Chinese style, for example. And this means that they want to level the playground so that enterprises and the businesses in both countries can eventually be fully connected with their counterparts. And then connectivity of all kinds in terms of infrastructure, pipelines, you name it, can be connected so that there will be less or even no obstacles for expansion of trade between China and Russia. Now, allow me to emphasize another point, which I personally believe very important. In this joint communique, China and Russia raised issues with several major points. For example, they both expressed the opposition against the AUKUS, that is the uh, nuclear submarine project involving the United States, United Kingdom and Australia. They pointed out very clear that it is in violation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and their obligations on these three countries. And they want to see that AUKUS is opposed and they want to see that there will be consequences for such violation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. They also raised the opposition to what the United States has been calling the Indo-Pacific, for example, because they say this is a violation, this is an uh, instability, for example, creating all the dangers, etc. Then, more importantly, they also reiterated their opposition against the continued expansion of NATO, pointing out that the continued expansion of NATO is not contributing to peace and stability, but disrupting peace and stability. Now, I think China and Russia by today have been making their case very clear, not only to the Chinese people and the Russian people on the one hand, but mostly to the whole world, what they care about and what they stand for. And I think such closing ranks and such reiteration of their opposition against several initiatives in the world will have profound significances because the world is for peace and stability. We will not allow any other country or any other groups of country to pretend to be the overlord of mankind. No, they don't possess truth. I think Truth is a developing process. All countries have the right to develop, and no country has the right to deprive countries like China or Russia their right of economic development. That is a very profound signal from the meetings in Moscow. Joseph, uh, he's talking about how profound this is. A lot of people chiming in, as Dimitri pointed out, uh, Western press talking about the significance of this get-together. We're, we're also hearing from Alexander Lukin. He's at the Russian Academy of Sciences, where he is the director of the Institute of China and Contemporary Asia. He talked about the significance of this state visit. Let's listen to what he had to say. Symbolically, this thing is very important, that he came to Russia as his first uh, as his first overseas visit after being re-elected because i think that uh, president xi wants to stress that russia remains uh, china's most important strategic partner i think that the main uh, thing that russia and china share are the principles of international security joseph let me get your thoughts on what he what he had to say about uh, the principles of international security and maybe kind of Using uh, what Victor said as a springboard, as he pointed out, AUKUS, the Indo-Pacific, which uh, people in China see as just an effort at containment, 
NATO expansion. Uh, we all know the story about Jim Baker assuring uh, Russia that, you know, we're not going to go an inch further east. And, and of course, that hasn't been the case. Talk to us about the shared principles that China and Russia have and how they're trying to tell their story on the world stage. Well, it's absolutely clear that the United States is trying to advance uh, new NATO-like uh, alliances in Asia against China. It's also clear that uh, the United States has been trying to push NATO to expand its interest, to expand its remit, to confront China. And it's clear that both Beijing and, and, and Moscow are very much opposed to this. Now, the thing that really struck me about this uh, uh, meeting, uh, there was one, one term in one of the Chinese uh, uh, official statements that, uh, that this meeting uh, demonstrates that the relationship between uh, China and Russia has gone beyond bilateral. And that's a very compelling uh, description. And, and I look for, you know, other, other aspects that try to explain what this means. We see terms like uh, strategic coordination. Now, if we, if we look at what other countries have this kind of uh, maybe beyond bilateral relationship, the, the, the first one that comes to mind, I think, is uh, the, the U.S. has what it calls a special relationship uh, with the United Kingdom. But in this case, we know that uh, China and Russia have both stressed that this is not a military alliance. And I think the, the coordination here is of, of several sorts. Uh, obviously, uh, increasing trade uh, and perhaps large-scale development projects like the possible uh, gas pipeline that would cross uh, uh, Mongolia. Um, but uh, also in, in terms of uh, opposing sanctions, uh, unilateralism, uh, coordinating uh, some shared concerns on the Security Council, um, calling for an investigation of the Nord Stream uh, destruct, uh, destruction. Uh, and now, of course, I, I think the, the biggest story is promoting uh, a diplomatic resolution to the crisis in Ukraine. Anton, uh, Western nations in Washington in particular uh, watching this meeting very, very closely. And, and we're hearing a lot from Washington uh, where they're pressing China, you got to do something, uh, kind of rein in Russia, as they say, and then, and then also saying, oh, you know, being very critical of China at the same time. Um, and, and I heard one analyst in China today say that uh, there are a lot of uh, major players that just don't want to see what, what we're witnessing in Moscow right now. I want to get your thoughts on that. What's the view in Washington, D.C.? Well, the view in Washington, as in the general Anglo-Saxon, especially Western mainstream media, is um, fixated on uh, Ukraine. Um, understandably so, because there is a violent conflict going on there. But it's more sort of indicative to me, Mike, of what's been going on in general over the past, what, 14 months now of this uh, war, which is um, this absolute uh, fixation uh, by the United States, first and foremost, on Ukraine to the detriment of many other issues that are more important to countries in the so-called global South, for lack of a better term. And the fact that the mainstream media in the West, and certainly here in Washington, including, by the way, the statements coming out of the State Department and uh, uh, Secretary Blinken, again, the focus on Ukraine tells me that either they are missing the plot of what's going on, or that they are uh, choosing to ignore it. Because the implications of what's going on in Moscow today go above and beyond um, uh, Ukraine. Um, the Ukraine, uh, the war in Ukraine right now, as the broader Ukraine crisis, of which it is currently the most violent uh, culmination, is really an emanation of much deeper geopolitical tectonic uh, shifts uh, in the world. Um, and it's also a catalyst for things that had started uh, well over a decade ago, which is this recalibration geoeconomic recalibration of the global um, economy. Um, the Russians and the Chinese really spend more time speaking to the rest of the developing world than I have heard the Europeans or the Americans actually speak. And it's interesting to see that the United States, which really sort of inherited the planet after the dissolution of the Soviet Union just 30 years ago, has now become, uh, or is becoming, I should say, sort of a, an increasingly marginalized uh, player. I see this meeting in the context of other things that are going on, such as the 
Chinese moderated uh, rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Listen, it used to be that it was inconceivable that something like this would happen without the United States either leading it or at least being one of the most important players. But look at what's going on um, now. Next week, um, the Brazilian president, uh, Lula da Silva, will be in China with a five-day visit. Um, the Chinese and the Russians are not fixated on Ukraine. They are thinking in terms of Eurasia as an, a huge economic block. And beyond that, they are appealing to the rest of the planet, especially to Africa and Latin America and the rest of the Asian nations, um, attracting them to their different model of development, which is not focused on the West exclusively, but where all of the players get the right to set the terms of the game uh, which they are invited to play. Now, whether this is successful, we will have to wait and see. But it's certainly a different narrative, and it's a different tone of engaging with the rest of the world. Yeah, Joseph, uh, China just piggybacking off of what he just brought up. Uh, Charlie Campbell just recently wrote a piece in Time magazine. I'll read just a little bit of it for you. He writes, in the pantheon of intractable, visceral conflicts, the few between Iran and Saudi Arabia sits below few, rooted in doctrine and meshed in history and waged via proxies across the Middle East. So as a way of establishing your peace-building chops, it's not a bad place to start. And the agreement signed in Beijing between Iran and Saudi Arabia, as, as Anton was pointing out, really remarkable in many ways. And as he pointed out as well, this is something the United States would have been out front doing. Um, it really has uh, created China, in a sense, as a global truce broker. Now they're there in Russia talking about doing something about Ukraine. They have a peace plan out there. I don't hear a lot of other countries uh, proposing peace plans, 12-point uh, plans. Can you talk to us about their efforts on the world stage, this current approach of proposing peace, promoting dialogue? The, the first thing is, I think it's very, very clear that we are in a world that is facing a number of intersexing uh, existential crises. These include, obviously, climate change, um, uh, which some scientists believe correlates with novel disease uh, outbreaks. Um, we also have uh, uh, the growing conflict between the United States and China. And additionally, we have uh, what I think a lot of uh, uh, analysts believe is uh, sooner or later the coming of the of the end of the of dollar domination, and uh, this is going to create uh, an even bigger uh, tectonic shift. Uh, certainly, it will it will create a lot of pain and, and uh, discomfort, and perhaps even uh, 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 some global economic collapse. But uh, I think that uh, in, in, in the context of all of these uh, challenges, when they start intersecting, they increase the likelihood or the chance that we might move to some sort of broader uh, scale conflict. Uh, certainly, it, it, we've seen the United States act uh, aggressively when it feels like its dominance is, is directly threatened. And certainly, if, if the dollar is going to collapse as the global currency, that would, that would be a direct threat to the U.S. in so much as its economy is really a house of cards at this point, uh, uh, built on the on the ability of the Fed and the U.S. government to abuse the dollar uh, to paper over their their, their failures in governance and, and economic management. That said, my, my sense is that China correctly perceives that this is a, a very much a, a growing threat, and um, they understand that the only way to counter this threat is to counter it with peace, with peaceful development, but but above all, by becoming a peacemaker. peacemaker. And I think you're right, stepping into this, uh, this long-term conflict uh, between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which, by the way, was substantially driven, not so much by, by ideology, but by the support that the United States had for the former Shah of Iran, uh, which they had supported because they wanted him to support the dollar uh, in tandem with uh, 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 linking that uh, support with what was happening in Saudi Arabia with the dollar. And that, of course, uh, poisoned the relationship with uh, the government that succeeded the Shah. Uh, but now, I, you know, we're, we're talking about, even, even before the conflict in Ukraine, there was talk between the EU, Russia, and China about moving past the dollar and oil trade. Uh, we know that uh, President Xi was in the Middle East recently talking about this. Um, we know that the relationship between Saudi Arabia and the United States has soured uh, significantly. So I think we're, what we're seeing in real time is this movement uh, towards this new world order, um, one in which um, the United States uh, risks becoming a, a major loser, um, but, but above all, because China is playing the role of peacemaker. And let me be very clear, I'm very optimistic that we will see some forward progress 
uh, with this conflict in Ukraine. But I'm, I'm looking beyond that now. I'm, I'm thinking, okay, maybe we can see uh, uh, some improved ties between uh, China and India and, and beyond. Uh, what are the broader ramifications for the Middle East and for the conflicts in the Middle East? This is, this is I think, what we all have to be uh, uh, applauding and supporting, and this is what I'm looking at with President Xi's visit to uh, Moscow. Well, and Dmitry, let me get the sense there in Russia. Are, are they ready to resume uh, peace talks? Can China be a catalyst here in, in moving the ball forward, so to speak? Well, unfortunately, uh, I would not expect the solution anytime soon. Uh, not because Russia doesn't want it or China doesn't want it, but because the sponsors of the regime in Kiev don't want it. Uh, they are pumping more and more weapons uh, into Ukraine. There is now uh, some talk uh, from, um, uh, you know, the officials in London about supplying Ukraine with uh, you know, war, war has with depleted new uranium. You know, you can imagine how that was received in Russia. Uh, France is talking about sending not just tanks, but fighter jets. Uh, we hear, the, uh, you know, talk about sending military planes from Poland all the time. Uh, Zelensky keeps talking about some kind of an offensive he's going to undertake this spring. That may be coming. So, unfortunately, I would not expect uh, on the Ukrainian front uh, a huge improvement anytime soon. Well, but uh, I agree absolutely with Joseph. Uh, I would add, you know, uh, if someone listening to the mainstream media heard our conversation, that person might think, uh, oh, we are completely isolated, you know, uh, we are talking very differently from the rest of the global media. But if you pay attention uh, to the logic uh, uh, and uh, not just repeat uh, what the global media says, you will see certain, uh, in certain uh, you know, uh, mistakes, <laughs> obvious logical mistakes in the narrative that we get from the global media. For example, in uh, the French magazine Le Point, uh, they asked their expert, uh, Pierre Grosset, to comment on uh, uh, Xi's visit to China. And Pierre Grosset said, I quote, uh, Putin and the Xi pose as the saviors of real international law, of real international order, which they see threatened by the actions of the United States and their allies after the world, after the end of the World War II. And, you know, when I read it, I thought, Jesus, that's exactly right, you know. Uh, exactly. Uh, why are we seeing all of these terrible wars? Uh, why is the United Nations not working? Yeah. Because well, of the United well, States, not uh, not uh, we are not. Uh, uh, Dimitri, you know, unfortunately, uh, we've, we've, we've run out of time. I, I, we're going to have to leave it there. I apologize. We've run out of time. A great discussion. I'm Mike Walter in Washington, D.C. want to thank you so much for watching another edition of The Heat.